Today we're going to review this Lodge 14 inch cast iron wok. Is this a great wok for your money? I don't know. Let's find out. Hi and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Here's what we're going to do in today's video. This wok just came in. We're going to get it opened up, unbox it, take a look at it, go through all of its stats and features. Then we're going to cook a bunch of hopefully delicious food. We're going to cook some beef, some chicken, some veggies. We're going to do some stir fry, maybe do some fried rice. See if this thing produces delicious food. And finally, we're going to answer the question, is this a good wok for your money? I don't know. Well, let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and unbox it now. Paid about $50 for this wok with my own money. Uh, this is not a wok that was provided for any kind of promotional purposes or any kind of free demo review copy. Paid for it with my own money. Hope it keeps my reviews as genuine as possible. And while I'm opening this thing up now, it might be a great time to go ahead and subscribe to the old channel. And here it is, the Lodge 14 inch cast iron wok. First reaction, thing is darn heavy. Made by Lodge in Tennessee, where they know a lot about cast iron cookware. College football, not so much. Okay, I've actually run into a little bit of a snag here. I'm gonna call timeout on this review. I had unboxed this thing. I had done the intro to the video. I was getting ready to do some close-up photography, some still photography of the walk for the review. And I noticed this. There is a crack that runs completely through the handle. And if I put some pressure on the handle, I can actually feel it move just a little bit. So that is not good. And what I think might have happened, I'm just guessing here, is that somewhere in the shipping process, maybe somebody dropped that box and it just hit on the handle at the correct angle and put a crack in there. Now, this can happen to cast iron, even though it's very, very tough, it can crack. I remember 20 years or so ago, I had a cast iron skillet from my grandmother, dropped it, it hit on the handle at the perfect angle and the handle snapped off of there. So that can happen to cast iron. So what I did was get on Amazon. I ordered this on Amazon, um, went to my order, clicked on the return button, and it said initially that this item is not eligible for return. That sounded pretty odd to me. So I chatted with the customer service agent. They explained that they just don't want me to ship this one back. They don't want me to return this one. They offered me either a replacement or a refund. I chose to get the replacement. And just like that, we're back. Okay, the new one just came in, the replacement model. I think we're good to go. Overview, let's get some stats and vitals. The Lodge weighs in right at 11 pounds. That's very heavy. Three to four times heavier than a similarly sized carbon steel wok. It's a 14 incher, rim to rim, four and a half inches high, and on the bottom, it has what will be considered a disc on another pan. But since cast iron is obviously cast and poured into molds and is all one piece of metal, this is more of an integrated flat plate, which allows the wok to sit flat. But while it sits flat, its interior cooking surface is actually curved, just like a round bottom wok would be. This allows easy use of different heat zones to cook your food. With an effective hot cooking area of seven inches or so in the middle, and cooler zones up the sides. So I like that you get the cooking benefits of a round bottom wok with the stability benefits of a flat bottomed as well. In fact, the Lodge is very stable. For reference, I recently reviewed a Debouille French carbon steel wok, and while it produced good food, I thought its vertical shape relative to its smaller flat bottom made it very unstable. This Lodge is the opposite. This thing ain't going anywhere. It's big enough to cook food for four adults or perhaps two normal sized people and one like me. The cast iron cooking surface is not as smooth as carbon steels, 
but lots of people think the little bumps and grooves give the seasoning something to grip to, and it might help hold food a little bit better when you slide food up the sides. The Lodge has two smaller helper handles on the sides, while there's no single long handle like many other walks have. So with the weight, heaviness, flat bottom, and handle design, you know going in that this walk is not built for moving and flipping food. So if you want to do this, the Lodge is not for you. But that's okay though, not everyone wants to do that, and you know it going in so it's not a surprise. So you buy the cast iron Lodge if you want heavy duty stability and cast iron cooking. So when you hear about wok cooking utilizing constant movement of food, just know that with the Lodge, that movement will come from you stirring and flipping with a spatula and not from lifting and moving the wok itself, which is just fine with lots of us. Seasoning. The Lodge comes pre-seasoned, so you can just jump right in and start cooking with it. However, we're kind of nuts about seasoning around here, so I went ahead and gave it a good seasoning anyway. Gave it a wash with soap and hot water, and I note this is the only time I have used soap on it. Then I used some good old fashioned Crisco, put some on a towel, heated the wok a little on the stove top so that the Crisco would melt, rubbed that all over the wok, then baked it in my oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour and let it cool. The color went from a dark grayish hue to a little more black, and that was it, easy. And note that this is a great method to use for maintenance seasonings down the road. Okay, enough yapping, I'm getting a little bit hungry. Let's get to the performance and cooking test. Now, as we go through these cooking tests, of course we'll focus on the food itself, but it's also important to look at how the wok performs on various cooktops. I'm using three cooktops, fancy gas stove, high quality electric glass flat top, and an induction burner, which even though it's a standalone burner, it is an 1800 watt, which is equal to burners on many big induction ranges. We'll start with some fried rice because it's easy and it's tough to make bad fried rice no matter how hard you try. I've been making batch after batch after batch of fried rice for weeks now. The basic recipe for fried rice seems to be day old rice combined with whatever else you have in the fridge. The texture of the rice is important. I've been using several brands of jasmine along with regular long grain white rice. Before cooking, I put the rice in a strainer and rinse it until the water runs clear. This helps remove some starch and make it less clumpy and sticky later. I boil the rice as normal, then spread it out on a cookie sheet to let it dry a little. In super arid Utah, where I live, set near an open window, the steaming rice actually dries out pretty darn quickly. I make several days worth at a time and store it in the fridge, which also seems to help the texture. For this first batch, let's start on the gas stove and make some basic egg fried rice with mixed veggies. The flat base of the lodge allows it to sit on any of my burner grates, but I found that the medium gas burner worked the best on my stove. Here I have the wok preheating. I wait until the temp at the base cooking area is over 500 degrees, which takes five minutes or so on this burner cranked up to high. In goes some peanut oil, which is good for high heat cooking. I see some smoking. In go beaten eggs. They cook up very quickly and are not sticking. In goes my rice. Stir, stir, stir. In go my mixed veggies. In goes a little soy sauce. Note how it evaporates quickly, even when poured higher up on the sides of the wok, so we know the sides are hot. More stirring and easy pretty darn tasty. We're off and cooking. So the Lodge did great with fried rice on the gas stove, which I expected. Now let's cook some more to illustrate how the Lodge cooks on the flat tops, and we'll start by looking at how it preheats. Even though the wok is 14 inches wide at the rim, the flat bottom disc area is really only about five and a half inches wide, roughly the diameter of a small saucepan. While I have three sizes of burner rings on my electric, the wok sat on the smallest burner ring the best. Same with the induction. Some induction ranges have higher output burners, but those rings are wider as well. I think 1800 watts in this ring size is pretty normal. But the flat tops do heat the wok differently than a gas flame does. Trying various combinations and intervals, I found that just cranking it to high for about eight minutes we get the bottom cooking area screaming hot, midway up the sides moderately hot but not hot enough to sear, and up near the rim remains relatively cool. Using the flat tops, I note that the drop-offs between the temperature zones are a little starker than I found using the gas cooktop. The gas flame definitely gave more even, almost smooth, gradient-like heating, 
and allow cooking a little farther up the sides. This means that you can cook greater quantities of food in fewer batches, which also means you can cook more quickly as well. Now the flat tops could easily get the bottom cooking area screaming hot, but the temps dropped off more rapidly up the sides, particularly with the induction. But I note gladly that I did not experience any warping issues with the induction like I've had with thinner pans, even though the temp differentials between bottom and rim could approach 600 degrees. The cast iron was tough enough to handle it. For fried rice on the flat tops, cooking in smaller quantities near the bottom middle of the pan was no big deal. As we get a little more ambitious with each successive dish we're gonna cook, we'll see if that changes. But for now, all the fried rice has been delicious. Fried rice heresy. Feeling pretty confident in my base level fried rice, I started experimenting a little. I tried putting the rice in the oven to toast it a little before cooking. It turned out okay. And for those of you who love to complain about the amount of butter I use in other videos, you're in luck. When I cook risotto, I toast the rice grains in butter, granted before they are hydrated, but still. And when I cook eggs for breakfast in my cast iron skillets, I use butter. And I don't cook the eggs at screaming high temperatures either. So in a flagrant act of fried rice heresy, I made batches of fried rice using butter and lower temperatures. I'd add some butter, then the rice, and instead of moving the rice, I'd let it sit and toast for a minute or two, then move it over and cook the egg, then go from there. The butter toasted rice grains develop nice chew and texture, and I gotta say, I like eggs and butter more than I like eggs and peanut oil. I cook batch after batch of fried rice, some with eggs, with leftover chicken, with leftover beef, with veggies, without veggies, on and on, and using all three cooktops. And you know what? All the fried rice made in the lodge was delicious and I chowed it all down. While fried rice made in a Chinese restaurant over a jet engine burner may be the gold standard, fried rice made at home on a home stove with this lodge wok is completely delicious as well. Now cooking rice is one thing, now let's see how the lodge sears and cooks some beef. Made this dish two nights in a row, first night using gas, second night on the induction. My wife found some super cheap cut of beef, bought a big pack of that, now I would normally never touch this cut, but it actually worked great for stir fry. And beginning here with the gas stove, I cranked it up on high, got the lodge's cooking surface to the mid 500 degree temperature range, and then go the strips, similar to searing a steak in a cast iron pan. Now lots of people talk about constant motion and stirring and flipping of food in a wok. What I found I like better is to spread the meat out in a single layer so that every piece has good contact with the wok then let it sit there for 45 seconds or so, and then start all that stirring. This gives me just a slight Maillard reaction, and seasoning and sauces aside, I like the flavor of beef better with a little bit of actual browning rather than just gray. On the gas, it took me three batches to cook half that pack of beef. I removed the batches, set them aside, then added the stir-fry veggies. Here I use some frozen Costco stir-fry veggies, obviously not fresh, but good quality and especially very convenient. For variety and weeknight convenience, bagged veggies and jarred sauces work well. So in goes more oil in the veggies. The bag says to add them frozen to the wok, but I actually boiled mine for a bit, let them steam and dry, and then add them. So if someone says these don't look crunchy, they look a little soft, they are exactly right, and that is precisely the way my tract likes them. Now let's switch horses midstream to the second night using the induction where it took four batches to cook that second half of that pack of beef. And the wok took longer between batches to return to smoking temperatures. But importantly, I did get good browning of the beef using the induction. I just had to use smaller and more batches. Here, I added a couple of items for the induction's veggies. My wife was in the kitchen and asked me if I'd like her to cut up some peppers and onions for the stir fry. Now, I think I've done 68 YouTube cooking videos. And this is the first time my wife has actually volunteered to help me out in any way. So after I picked my jaw up off the floor, I said, yes, that'd be great if you slice those up for me. She then asked me, what size do you want the peppers? I replied, how about one inch squares? She thought about that for a second and said, no, cut them into thin strips, just the way she wanted to anyway. I think that's what we call marriage. Anyway, for the induction veggies, after the beef, in goes some more oil. I note lots of oil is used in wok cooking. Then in go the onions and the specifically not one inch square red peppers. 
Cook those for a bit, then I added the stir-fried veggies, and here is where some starker differences emerged between the gas and induction cooktops. With the smaller hot zone on the induction, with this much food, I felt like the veggies steamed a little bit more than fried. On both, after cooking the veggies a bit, back in goes the beef, add some sauce, stir, slather it on top of rice, and delicious. Chicken and broccoli with brown sauce. Stars of the show here are boneless, skinless chicken breasts and fresh broccoli. Now, as for the fresh broccoli, you can tell that there aren't many foods that I fear in the kitchen. But on the short list of those that I do is fresh broccoli. I'm horrified. My body actively rejects fresh broccoli with a vengeance if there is even the slightest hint of crunch. So again here, I'm going to prepare and parboil my broccoli for six minutes or so first before it even gets anywhere near the wok. Whereas snappy, crunchy veggie fans might only boil it for a minute. Goody for you. I got everything ready to go. Marinated the meat, heated the lodge wok on high heat, medium-sized gas burner for about five to six minutes, Got it between 500 and 600 degrees at the cooking surface. In goes the chicken. I spread it out and let it brown just a little, 45 seconds to a minute, then started the rapid stirring. I cooked the chicken in batches and removed it when it was close to, but not quite all the way cooked. Then I added my parboiled broccoli and let it fry for a bit, added the sauce, which had a little cornstarch in it, let it thicken, added back the chicken. And here I noticed I had some delicious looking brown bits on the bottom of the wok. So I quickly grabbed a carton of salt water, excuse me, chicken stock, and deglazed those. And it turned out absolutely delicious. When I took the first bite, it tasted exactly like something I would get in a quality Chinese restaurant. Really, really good. Now over on the electric, I got similar delicious results. I heated the wok eight minutes on high, cooked the chicken in one extra batch, again had just a few sticky bits that I deglazed with chicken stock, and again, restaurant quality. So with the fried rice, with the beef, and with the chicken, the lodge is performing really well so far. Double fried sweet and sour chicken. With this recipe, I want to show the deep frying capabilities of the lodge. Breaded chicken is the star of the show here. Now you could make this recipe with one wok, but you'd have to cook not only in batches, but also in stages and move hot oil about. So it really works best with two. And since I was lucky enough to receive a damaged wok that Amazon said I could keep while they sent me another one to make up for it, I just so happen to have two. So let's go here. Here I'm using chicken thighs, as dark meat should handle deep frying a little better than white. I'm cutting them into roughly one inch chunks. Then I made a mix of all-purpose flour, a spoon of cornstarch, some salt, and some red cayenne, white, and black peppers to use as a dredge. My wife, somewhat surprisingly, again did some prep work and cut up some yellow and red peppers and onions for me. Again, these are specifically not one inch squared. For the deep fried chicken, I filled the wok one third full of canola oil brought it up to a skosh over 350 degrees. I used a thermometer to check the temp of the oil as I went. Then I dredged the chicken pieces, added them to a wire spider strainer, and as carefully as possible, lowered them into the hot oil. And it looks like they're really going to town in there. Each batch of chicken took about two and a half minutes to come up to temperature. I felt like the heavy cast iron did a good job of retaining heat and not cooling too much when the chicken went in. I'd pull out a piece and check it with the thermometer to make sure it was cooked thoroughly and made batches until it was all fried and then turned the flame down. Meanwhile, nel frattempo, I had been heating the other wok. When it was ready to go, I added some peanut oil, waited for some smoke wisps, then added the peppers and onions and stir fried them for a couple of minutes. Then I added the sauce, which was a little thin at first, but reduced and thickened as it cooked. As it was getting thicker, I brought the other wok back up to heat and refried the chicken. Now the chicken was already up to temp internally, but this second short frying really adds a little color and crunch to the exterior. Now some people criticize cast iron for retaining too much heat. They say that it's easier to cool down a carbon steel wok by simply moving it off the heat whereas food in a cast iron wok might continue to cook until it's overdone. To me, this is no big deal. You're standing there cooking anyway. When the food is done, just scoop it out. Then I spidered the chicken from wok one to wok two, mixed it well, then served it over rice. Again, absolutely delicious. 
Now, I thought this was absolutely restaurant quality, absolutely delicious, and my wife even asked me to make this again for Sunday dinner when her parents were coming over, so I know it was pretty darn good. That second frying gives a hint of texture and crunch to the chicken, which then softens up ever so slightly with the addition of the sauce. The lodges produce absolutely restaurant quality results here. Now, if I had a fortune cookie here, I think the saying would be, for every delicious meal, there's a kitchen full of mess to clean up. Looking at this mess in the kitchen, I turned to my wife and said, honey, do you think maybe you'd want to help out here just a little bit? She looked back at me and said, well, I did cut that onion. Let's take a look at cleanup and how the cast iron seasoning has held up so far. Now, I was a little bit worried about the sweet and sour sauce because it contained tomato, ketchup, and vinegar, two acidic ingredients that we use to strip seasoning from carbon steel. But I didn't see any big damage to the cast iron seasoning from it, or anything else I have cooked for that matter. Of course, if something removes a little seasoning, a little Crisco and time in the oven will fix that right up, as we showed earlier. Now, this disgusting used oil, what I did was strain this into an approved receptacle and immediately took it down to my local recycle center to be turned into clean burning biodiesel. Now as far as cleanup for the woks, the lodges cleaned up really easily for the most part. I used dish soap on them only once for that first cleaning right out of the box. Since then, I've only used hot water, a sponge, and a scrub brush. I'm also going to elevate this Lodge 10-inch wood handle cleaning brush. Once I mentioned not liking this brush when I used it in a Dutch oven cleaning video as the handle made it cramp down inside a Dutch oven. But with the slope sides of the Lodge wok, it works very well here, and this is my go-to cleaning brush for the woks. So the Lodge 14-inch cast iron wok, how'd it do? In the most important category, food quality, it did a fantastic job. I got absolutely restaurant quality food at home. Now it performed best on my gas stove, but with its flat sturdy bottom that makes good contact and didn't warp, it delivered really well on electric, and I would say even solidly on induction too. Now as we showed with the flat tops, you get good quality. You're gonna to have to take a little bit longer to preheat the wok. You're gonna to have to cook in smaller batches but the food quality was still absolutely delicious. Now here we have to acknowledge that the first one I received was damaged, but I think that damage happened during shipping and could have happened really to any product I ordered, but I give them credit, they made it right, and I think in normal home cooking, the quality will be superb. And answering the other question we posed at the beginning of the video, at around $50, is this a good walk for your money? Heck yeah it is. I actually think at that price, it's quite a bargain. I would happily buy another one. I think it's a pretty good looking wok too. So the Lodge 14 inch cast iron wok. I really like it and give it a thumbs up. Now, if you want one for yourself, check out the shopping links below. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video. Subscribing and using the affiliate links really helps out around here. Don't forget to post your questions and compliments below the video in the comment section. If you have complaints, Take those on down the road, Jack. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.